All right. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for tonight's Woo You event with Dr. Marguerite McDonald. She, her title of her presentation tonight is Ocular and Systemic Interplay in Thyroid Eye Disease, a multi Multidisciplinary Approach. Next slide. I'll be your host tonight. My name is Dr. Arielle Serenzi. Next slide. Thank you to Visionary Medical Education for hosting this event tonight. And thank you to Taya Pharma and Sun Pharma for supporting this event with a medical education grant. This will be worth one hour of CE credit, so please be sure to attend for a minimum of 50 minutes. For your COPE certificate, please fill out the survey link that is in the chat. Uh, it'll be there shortly, and it also will be there when the webinar ends. Uh, CE certificates will be delivered via email and sent to Arvo with your OE tracker numbers, but we will also have a QR code at the end of the event that you can use your OE tracker app to um, get the credit instantly on your phone. CE certificates will be otherwise emailed within four weeks. We'll save questions for the end of the presentation. You can ask that either in the chat section or the Q&A there at the bottom. And then if you are on your cell phone, you can find the Q&A at the top or the chat function under the three dots under more. So it is my honor to introduce our amazing speaker tonight, Dr. McDonald. She is a cornea, cataract, and refractive surgeon with OCLI Vision on Long Island. She is a clinical professor of ophthalmology at both NYU and Tulane. And then 1988, really cool, after years of research, Dr. McDonald performed the world's first laser vision correction procedure. And she was the first female president of the International Society of Refractive Surgery and the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Dr. McDonald also has over 1,800 publications. So we're so excited to hear from her tonight. These are her financial disclosures, all of which have been mitigated, and I'll have you take it away from here. Thank you so much, and thank you all for spending part of your evening to learn about thyroid eye disease. We're going to give an overview and talk about the disease burden. We're going to show the clinical studies of teprotumumab, uh, the studies that led to the FDA approval of this drug and uh, a couple of real world, world patient cases. So thyroid eye disease, the overview and disease burden is underappreciated, I think, by most uh, of us eye doctors. It is a serious, progressive autoimmune disease that can lean, lead to serious long-term repercussions. It can threaten vision. <clears throat> it can reactivate or flare over time. And it presents, unfortunately, with highly variable signs and symptoms that differ tremendously from patient to patient. Risk factors for TED include smoking, radioactive iodine treatment, female sex and increasing age, and as you see here, disfigurement and vision-threatening complications of TED may lead to psychosocial and functional burdens for the patients. So we're gonna uh, bust a few myths during the course of this lecture. One myth, patients who are euthyroid or hypothyroid cannot, cannot have thyroid eye disease. That is absolutely wrong. Hypothyroidism is actually present in 10.36% of patients with TED and euthyroidism is present in 7.9%. So, there's a lot of confusion about thyroid eye disease and Graves' disease. Thyroid eye disease is distinct from Graves' disease, and patients often present with dry eye disease, which is why they end up in our offices. So Graves' disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. The systemic sy symptoms are weight loss, fatigue, heat intolerance, tremors, palpitations due to their hyperthyroidism. And the American Thyroid Association and European Thyroid Association recommend screening all patients with Graves' disease for thyroid eye disease. And thyroid eye disease is often associated with hyperthyroidism, but is completely separate and distinct from Graves' disease. Ocular signs and symptoms like proptosin 
the proptosis and diplopia are due to inflammation and in tissue enlargement in the orbit. And the incidence is 19 out of 100,000 people per year in the United States. So overlapping circles, but two distinct entities. And approximately 40% of the Graves' disease patients will go on to develop thyroid eye disease, but not everybody. And I mentioned dry eye disease. <clears throat> this is commonly occurring due to the abnormalities of the eyelid or the ocular surface that we'll delve into. Dry eye disease is present in 65.2% of patients with thyroid eye disease in a recent study. So it's incumbent upon us as eye care specialists to consider completing a differential diagnosis to evaluate the possibility of thyroid eye disease in patients with thyroid conditions and the symptoms of dry eye disease. So thyroid eye disease is identified by ongoing inflammation, tissue expansion, and remodeling around the eye. So this is a schematic of a normal healthy eye. And um, I don't know, can you see my cursor moving? Uh, not sure. Yes, uh, we can. Oh, good. There are thin extraocular muscles, healthy and normal in size, the optic nerve, the eyelids. This is normal. But with thyroid eye disease, one of the first things that happens is the extraocular muscles expand and become inflamed. Then uh, there's orbital tissue and fat expansion. And this continues to the point <clears throat> where there is eyelid retraction and proptosis and even optic nerve compression. So uh, it's a journey and uh, it's our opportunity to identify these people and interrupt the downward spiral before it gets to the dire end stage of optic nerve compression. So how does this drug work? The drug I'm about to tell you about, it, ta it targets IGF-1R. This helps reduce inflammation and prevents muscle and fat tissue remodeling and expansion behind the eye. More about that in a moment. Another myth. All patients with thyroid eye disease present with obvious proptosis. That is incorrect. TED has a heterogeneous presentation. Proptosis is present in 62% of patients, meaning 38% don't have this obvious sign. So th this will just illustrate the heterogeneous presentation of thyroid eye disease so we can identify it early and treat proactively. And like any disease in the human body, early intervention helps improve long-term outcomes and avoid potentially permanent damage. So eyelid retraction, 91% of TED patients are affected. They have eyelid edema also, lag ophthalmos, redness and swelling. Uh, I find a tremendous number have noc nocturnal lag ophthalmos with red blurry eyes in the morning. Proptosis, 62% affected, as I mentioned, it's disfiguring. It causes pressure and or pain behind the eyes. Extraocular muscle involvement, slightly over half of the patients, 51% have diplopia. They get strabismus with double vision, and they also feel pressure and or pain behind the eyes, and they can develop optic neuropathy. And the conjunctival uh, presentations and corneal. We get chemosis, conjunctival injection, and redness. As I mentioned, exposure keratopathy. They have dry, gritty eyes. Often they have excessive tearing and photophobia and blurry and fluctuating vision. So many, many different possible presentations as they come to see us. Another myth. Patients with low disease activity or long duration TED have little to no impact on their quality of life. Absolutely not. Patients with TED report an impact on their quality of life 
regardless of disease activity or duration. And we'll look into that in greater detail in a moment. So this is a wonderful study documenting the profound impact TED has on the patient's psychosocial health and their decline in well-being. This was a survey of patients with a duration of TED less than one uh, up to greater than 10 years, almost 400 patients. And they responded to these questions. Which of the following have you experienced because of TED in the past two months? Concerned, uh, increased concern about appearance, 44%. Feeling sad, blue, or depressed, 37%. Decline in self-confidence, 36%. <clears throat> Decline in general feeling of well-being, 33%. And, and you can see the last three bullet points. And a fully 20% avoid going out in public. They're so ashamed and upset by their appearance. So this is a quote from a real patient from a recent survey. This is a very difficult disease that causes tremendous damage to one's health, ability to be independent, and psychological well being. As is the case with other auto autoimmune diseases, it is unpredictable, triggers other significant health problems, and is always with you. So, this is uh, another way to look at the signs and symptoms of TED and the impact on our patients' quality of life. So this is patient reported impact here on the x-axis and clinical signs and symptoms on the y-axis. So when the signs and symptoms are mild, it is a distracting burden. When they are moderate, it's disrupting. And when, it, when they are severe, it is actually disabling. So um, it's a good idea for us to try to grade the signs and symptoms um, like eye pain, redness, swelling, eye bulging, double vision, et cetera, to make note whether they're mild, moderate, or severe. Also, their emotional well being. I certainly have some patients who were suicidally depressed over their appearance. And daily activities are they easy to perform or are they difficult or actually almost impossible to perform? Normal things like walking outdoors driving or reading. So we have to consider this burden when assessing our patients and whether or not to take action. So I mentioned a drug that has been fairly recently approved. It is the first and only FDA approved treatment for thyroid eye disease, regardless of disease activity or duration. So it's a mouthful. And even though I'm drinking ocean spray, cranberry juice, um, not wine, <laughs> it's a mouthful. It's teprotumumab, TRBW. So um, I, I will refer to it uh, most of the time as the active agent. <clears throat> so teprotumumab, TRBW, was first evaluated in a randomized double mass placebo controlled phase two and phase three study two studies in patients with high disease activity and short duration. So they had 171 patients with bona fide TED. They randomized them to teprotumumab or placebo. <clears throat> and you see the breakout phase two and phase three. And these patients received in the, um, in the active and the placebo groups, eight infusions, for a total of you know, one each three weeks. So the active group actually did get the drug at 10 milligrams per kilogram for the first initial dose. And then three weeks later, and for the next seven additional infusions, they got a higher dose, 20 milligrams per kilogram. And of course, the placebos got an infusion of you know, salt water uh, and uh, no one, knew whether they were in the active or the placebo group, of course, as in any really well-designed study. So the primary efficacy endpoint was proptosis responder rate at week 24. In other words, how many had a two millimeter or greater 
reduction in proptosis. That's a very high bar to hit. That was considered clinically meaningful. But other key efficacy endpoints were the diplopia responder rate at week 24, and also inflammatory signs or symptoms responder rate at week 24 with a clinical activity scale of one or zero. So the clinical activity scale is kind of a composite scale so that everybody can get one meaningful number. And uh, that's how the study was designed. And the key inclusion criteria were greater than 18 years of age up to 80. And they had to have inflammatory signs and symptoms of thyroid eye disease with a clinical activity score of four or greater. And they had to have moderate to severe TED associated with lid retraction of greater than or equal to two millimeters, proptosis of three millimeters or greater above normal. You see moderate or severe soft tissue involvement and or periodic or constant diplopia. They had to be euthyroid or had uh, FT3 and FT4 less than 50% above or below normal limits. So very carefully designed study with amazing outcomes. The active group significantly uh, had a decrease in prognosis and in, in, with high disease activity in short duration. And it happened pretty quickly. So dark green is the active group, gray is placebo. You can see <clears throat> there is separation between the two groups at their first visit after starting the study as early as week six. And the separation in proptosis responder rate continued to improve with time the separation got greater and greater. And you see the proptosis responder rate hit 83% by week 24. And the placebo group you know, barely changed. So if you look at the right side of this slide, change from baseline and proptosis to week 24, you see an, an astonishing uh, data that matches the first graph. The Mean change from baseline in millimeters. This is really amazing. The mean change by week 24 was 3.32 millimeters versus a half a millimeter basically for the placebo. So um, powerful data showing that it's effective. Now, another myth, teprotumumab <laughs> is only used to treat patients with high disease activity and short duration thyroid eye disease. So that is wrong. It's indicated for the treatment of thyroid eye disease regardless of disease activity or duration. So here's another study. The active was evaluated in a randomized double matched placebo controlled phase four study meaning post-approval, it had already been approved for high activity, short duration patients. So this phase four study was in patients with low disease activity and long duration. They'd been suffering a long time. So uh, there was the 24 week treatment phase and primary efficacy outcome was changed from baseline in proptosis in millimeters at week 24 and the secondary efficacy outcome was proptosis responder rate. And the key enrollment criteria had some overlay with the first group, but um, they had to be 18 years of age or older. They had to have an initial diagnosis of thyroid eye disease greater than or equal to two and less than 10 years prior to screening. They couldn't have had any prior orbital irradiation orbital decompression surgery or strabismus surgery. And the clinical activity score had to be less than or equal to one in both eyes for at least one year prior to the screening. So low activity uh, and no new inflammatory TED symptoms for at least a year prior to screening. But they had to have pro a proptosis increase of greater than or equal to three millimeters from the patient baseline before the diagnosis. Uh, and or above normal for the race and gender. So low disease activity, long duration. And you see similar results. 
there was significant and continuous reductions in proptosis. So this is the mean change from baseline in proptosis. And here are these people who've been suffering for years and they're still getting a response to the treatment and uh, very statistically significantly different from the placebo group. Actually 62% of the patients achieved a two millimeter or greater reduction in proptosis at week 24, which was a secondary endpoint with teprotumumab versus 25% with placebo. <clears throat> so it's good for this group of patients as well. So here are some before and after pictures from the phase two clinical trial. Uh, patient one baseline up here and after her eight infusions, what a dramatic difference. S second column, patient two, another dramatic outcome. And patient three, the last column, baseline and after eight infusions, just dramatic improvements. Individual results can vary, of course, but most patients uh, do profit from it fairly dramatically. So the integrated safety overview, this is safety data from phase two and phase three. These are adverse reactions that occurred in 5% or more of the patients who were treated with the active. And then uh, in, in a situation where the percentage impacted was greater than the incidence found in the placebo group. <clears throat> so the most common muscle spasms, 25%. Nausea, 17%. You can see the placebo group had a small incidence of these same things. Alopecia in 13% versus 8% in placebo. Diarrhea, 12%. Fatigue, okay. The ones that catch our eye are hyperglycemia. You do have to be careful with diabetic patients. They have to watch their sugars. Uh, it's manageable, but you have to know in advance to look out for it. And this one, hearing impairment. So <clears throat> this drug shrinks fat in the orbit. There are fat pads uh, in the ear uh, near the tympanic membrane, and they are impacted by the drug in some patients. So, you know, the FDA was not alarmed by this because um, it had reversed in virtually everyone. Um, if the patient got um, a break or discontinued the medication, the hearing recovered. But that is something uh, that you have to tell your patients about and you might proactively test them. It turns out <laughs> that a very high percentage of patients with Graves' disease not even TED, have hearing impairment. So a lot of doctors will just get their hearing tested um, at the beginning in the middle and the end if they especially have a history of hearing issues. Discusia, headache, dry skin, weight decreased, nail disorder and menstrual disorders you see here in very, very small percentages, but greater than pl uh, placebo. So, in summary, from phase two and phase three, 89% of the patients completed the full treatment course with the active ingredient teprotimumab versus 93% who completed with the placebo. The FDA, who has you know, e extremely high standards in this regard, they said most adverse events are mild, moderate, manageable, or resolved during or after treatment, which is why they went ahead and approved the drug. They said, we see no new safety signals in the patients with low disease activity and long duration TED in the phase four study. So that's why the drug went on to approval. So here is a real world patient case. And um, once again, it's a case report. It's a patient with TED, individual experiences with this drug can, can vary. And we'll get started here. So this is a real patient. 
a 59 year old female named Laura and Dr. David Weinberg gave us uh, this case presentation. And of course, even her first name has been changed. So she had less than one year history of thyroid disease. She had very high disease activity, activity, sudden onset of symptoms. She did have a history of Hashimoto's disease. So history of a thyroid disorder. She was a previous smoker and her visual acuity before getting the drug was 2025 OU. Her color vision was normal. On clinical exam, she had proptosis, 24 millimeters OD, 23 millimeters OS. She had intermittent diplopia and extraocular muscle restriction, inflama inflammatory signs and a symptom score of five out of seven in both eyes with eyelid retraction and lag of thalamus. So this is her baseline data. And after eight infusions, her visual acuity improved to 2020 OU. The proptosis dropped to 19 OD and 19 OS. So that was a five millimeter reduction in the right eye, a four millimeter reduction in the left eye from baseline. The diplopia resolved, extraocular motility improved. <clears throat> Her inflammatory signs and symptom score was zero and seven OU. Her eyelid retraction improved, lag of thalamus resolved completely. She did experience mild leg cramps, a little hair loss and softening of fingernails and toenails, but all of that resolved when she stopped her infusions, her eighth infusion. So, it really is important to counsel people. Uh, most people want to proceed with it. Occasionally someone will be so put off by it that they say, I'm sorry, this is not for me. But um, it's important that you mention infusion reactions can occur. They're reported in about 4% of patients on the active drug. Mild were, they, most reactions were mild or moderate. And um, they can occur at any time. So they could occur during the first infusion, during the last infusion, and if they have any signs, any potential infusion related reactions, a rash on their arm, anything, they should immediately call their healthcare provider. Also, you can have an exacerbation of pre existing inflammatory bowel disease. So those patients have to be monitored for a disease flare up. And if if they're having an exacerbation, just discontinue the drug. And um, most of the time that presents itself as uh, an increase in diarrhea. Hyperglycemia, we already, already talked about. In the clinical trials, 10% of the patients, two thirds of whom had pre-existing diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance, experienced hyperglycemia. So once again, you have to watch for it. Uh, they have to be controlled carefully before and during treatment. We just talked at some length about hearing impairment and um, the patient should be told to contact their healthcare provider immediately if they experience any signs or symptoms of hearing impairment or changes in hearing. And um, pregnancy, you have to advise women of childbearing potential that they cannot take this drug. It can cause harm to a fetus. So uh, women of childbearing potential need to use effective con contraception before, during, and for six months after the last dose. So once again, very quickly, here are the most common adverse reactions, muscle spasm, nausea, alopecia, diarrhea, fatigue, et cetera. So you have to coordinate with the co-management team and the sites of care to ensure there's appropriate monitoring. So, which brings us to another myth. If I can't provide infusion therapies in my practice, I can't prescribe this drug. That's wrong. Infusion of teprotumumab can be performed in various settings, including hospital outpatient departments, physician owned infusion centers and independent infusion centers. So um, eye doctors are amongst the very few uh, doctors who don't routinely use infusion centers, 
but we're getting more and more used to it uh, with the introduction of this drug. And <clears throat> when you write a prescription for this drug, a team helps you. They realize that we are uh, not used to working with infusion centers. So they connect our patient with a patient access liaison who supports the patient throughout the whole treatment journey. The, they coordinate. So the medication works, the schedule is set up and they make sure to stay in constant contact with the patient. Also, um, if you don't know who could possibly treat TED with this drug and you don't wish to take it on yourself, no worries. Uh, there is a TED specialist finder on the website for the drug. And you can find a doctor near you who will take this on, who's routinely using this drug. And of course, the drug company can come to your office and educate everyone, educate the team members. So everybody will have some knowledge on this topic. And there are a host of additional resources about this drug and thyroid eye disease that are available online and through the representative. So another myth, the physician who prescribes this drug is the only healthcare provider involved in managing the treatment outcomes and follow-up. No, it actually does take a team. Uh, it takes the eye doctor, the primary care doctor, an endocrinologist, and an oculofacial plastic surgeon. Uh, many of these cases uh, can be managed with the drug, not all. Uh, in the past, all of these presenting symptoms were managed with surgery, but it's still good to have an oculofacial plastic surgeon on the team to see you know, how much benefit was derived from the drug and if anything uh, has to be done surgically. Uh, our practice in particular has two outstanding oculoplastic surgeons who routinely operate on these patients with, uh, with lag ophthalmos proptosis. They do orbital floor fractures and let the fat uh, blow into the maxillary sinuses. There are so many things that can be done if the drug isn't getting the whole job done. So yeah, in summary, thyroid eye disease is a lifelong and progressive autoimmune disease that is debilitating and potentially disfiguring and vision threatening. Tepro Tumabab is the first and only FDA approved treatment for this condition, regardless of disease activity or duration. So far over 15,000 US patients have been treated with the drug. So even if we don't wanna get into the weeds on this to identify the patient early and either initiate or refer for treatment is, is really critical. So I wanna show you this. Uh, there was a subset of patients that actually underwent orbital uh, MRIs. Um, and this is a great way to document the response to the drug. So the left column is a phase three patient. Uh, there were uh, six in that phase three group that agreed to undergo serial MRIs. And the right column is phase four. Once again, six patients agreed to go ser undergo serial MRIs. And um, I know um, these look a little foreign at first, but uh, the baseline is the top. So the green and blue arrowheads point to the inferior rectus muscle and the orbital fat. So this is baseline and they are big and juicy. So if you look down here at week 24, they are much, much smaller. Actually, uh, in this, this little group of six patients from phase three, the extraocular muscle volume was reduced from baseline by 33%. And the fat volume was reduced from baseline by 29%, both statistically significant, highly statistically significant. Over here, now uh, 
once again, we're looking at rectus muscles, the superior and inferior rectus muscles. Let me get my cursor here. And the extraocular muscle size was dramatically reduced. Averaging these six patients from phase four, remember, uh, long, long duration of activity. The extraocular muscle volume reduction from baseline was 25%. And the fat volume reduction from baseline was 35%. Just uh, tremendous responses. We're grateful that we had a, a handful of patients who allowed us to do uh, two MRIs on them each. So um, I am delighted to answer any questions by email. That's my email address. It's a long one. Marguerite, MCD, MD at AOL. And um, I believe we're going to do some questions. Yes. So we have quite a few in the Q&A currently. Um, one of the first questions was, uh, which of the most which which is the most commonly affected muscles or nerves in the case of strabismus with um, thyroid eye disease? Um, it can be any, but it it seems to be the medial and uh, rectus and the lateral rectus. And then um, another question was. How would you work up a new patient with scleral show or lateral gaze restriction with no history of strabismus, stroke, um, palsy, diplopia, et cetera? So, um, so they have retraction and muscle restriction, correct? Uh, just it's uh, well, scleral show and then lateral gaze restriction. Okay. So that, those, uh, that combination is a big red flag. And um, I would treat the leg ophthalmus with, you know, nighttime ointment, um, artificial tears, preservative free frequently during the day. But I would get an endocrinologist on board to do uh, a thyroid workup. And um, once again, even if they are, they come back with all the tests and they're euthyroid or even a tiny percent hypothyroid, um, that is an indication I would proceed with uh, an MRI of the orbits. And if I see some of the classic findings, they're going on this drug. But I would, but once again, these people need a team. So you, the infusion center, the endocrinologist, the primary care, but that combination of lag ophthalmus and muscle restriction on lateral gaze, uh, that's a big, big, big red flag, especially sudden onset or recent onset in a fully grown adult. Another question was, um, do you often see that infusions need to be repeated? And if so, how many, how many times do you see this and how many times would it be, you know, too many times? That's an excellent question. Uh, there are data being collected now about what percentage of patients eventually go on to need another infusion? And is it as effective as the first one and how long does it last? We don't know the answer yet, but there should be papers presenting data on this within the next one to two years. Great. And then if, if we wanted to do a thyroid workup ourselves, um, wanted to go ahead and submit some orders in, what would be a, what would a typical thyroid workup look, uh, look like? T3, T4, and TSH would be a great baseline, those three. Great. A few questions were about some of the potential um, side effects, uh, like alopecia. Does that typically reverse after discontinuation of the drug? Yes. Yes, it does. Great. And then those with um, hearing loss, do you find that... Um, there are many who it, who the hearing loss does not resolve after the treatment is discontinued, or the, is there any like permanent hearing loss? Uh, there is an exceedingly small chance that the hearing loss will be permanent. Um, 
it it was not to the point where it alarmed the FDA. There there was no one in this particular set of data, the phase two, phase three, that had permanent hearing loss. Uh, but if somebody starts to get it, it would be a good idea to discontinue the drug. And if somebody goes into the trial with hearing loss, then you have to watch them carefully and get a hearing test done before treatment, smack in the middle of it, and at the end. For sure. Um, how long do you wait before you recommend surgical intervention? So that is, it, it has to do with uh, the response you see and is it adequate? If you still have someone who has such lid retraction and proptosis after treatment, maybe they're better, maybe they're you know, a little better, Maybe they're not better. A small percentage of people don't respond. If they have exposure keratitis to the point where you're worried about a perforating ulcer, which I've seen, I've seen people present to me for the first time with perforating corneal ulcers from extreme exposure. You know, if you, if you think they're at risk of that, they need surgery. I would get, actually, when I identify these patients, I get an oculoplastic surgeon and an endocrinologist on board very quickly. I think another treatment option that I see often at, at my practice, but all I do is specialty contacts is scleral lenses are a good option for these patients to kind of like constantly bathe their corneas um, in saline. I have a few patients with thyroid eye disease. It's just their sclerals get beat up and <laughs> dry out a lot. I 100% agree. 100% scleral lenses are great for these people if they are committed to it and they are ag agile enough to insert and remove. Yeah. Sure. Uh, do you have an exophthalmometer that you use and, and recommend? We use the good old Hertel, H-E-R-T-E-L, exophthalmometer. It's, uh, it's probably 100 years old. Uh, okay. this, but it, it works great. It's easy and repeatable. Great. And then do you know if the, we have some Canadian friends on, on uh, our presentation tonight. Do you know if the drug is available in Canada? I apologize. I do not. I do not know. But um, that would be something probably we can find out on their website, I would imagine. For sure. Uh, let's see here. And then would you mind reminding us of some of the contraindications of, um, of using this treatment option? Well, pregnancy is an absolute contraindication. Uh, the other contraindications are partial. In other words, you can put diabetics on this drug. Uh, you just have to watch their blood sugar very carefully, work with their PCP or endocrinologist. Uh, you might even have to put them in extreme cases on a sliding scale of insulin um, while they're on, just don't bother on the treatment. Um, you have to watch out for the people with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, they can do very well, but some of them get horrific diarrhea and you have to really stop the drug. Those are the big ones. And of course, the hearing loss that I mentioned, you have to watch those people. And, and I apologize, I know some of these questions you answered um, during the presentation, so some of this will be a, a review, uh, but could you remind us the, the method of action for the infusion? So, uh, yes, it it's anti-inflammatory, and it, it uh, decreases inflammation in the extraocular muscles, and it shrinks fat. It shrinks fat in the orbit. So these patients have a huge amount of orbital fat and very thickened uh, extraocular muscles. And uh, it interferes with that process. And like I said, um, you know, patients, because it, it decreases the amount of fat, patients usually lose a little weight on this. And the fat pads near the tympanic membrane can thin out which is why a percentage of patients start to have issues with hearing, but then you stop it in for the vast majority, those issues go away. 
Great. And in your experience, how have you found the accessibility is to, pay, to patients? Do you have to jump through a bunch of prior authorizations in order to get it approved? So in my experience, the drug company sends a team. They, they take over. They realize they, that we're, we're busy and we're not used to doing this kind of thing. So they swoop in and take over. They, they set up a patient liaison. Uh, they find the infusion center for the doctor. They, they take over and hold our hand through the whole thing. It's been actually pretty easy. And, and we know what the studies tell us in terms of, you know, the response. Um, but, you know, in your clinical experience, what percentage of patients do you see that respond um, to Tapiza? And then what would you consider a good response? So uh, in my experience, it, it matches pretty much the phase two, phase three data. So at least three quarters respond dramatically with a two millimeter or greater reduction in proptosis, which is amazing. And their lid retraction uh, improves dramatically as well as their exposure keratitis. So I would say my experience is pretty much like what the cl clinical trials that led to the approval. Okay. And have you noticed any patients that have had like a return of some of their um, signs and symptoms after discontinuation? Not yet. not yet. The drug has not been available in the U.S. for a very, very, very long time. So uh, I bring those people back. I, I watch them. But so far, no. I expect I will see that, but not yet. Okay. Very exciting stuff. I'm glad we had time for questions. We had quite a few of them in here. Um, so feel free to add any more if you guys think of any any others? Another questions was if, if it was available in all in all countries, but we can um, refer to the website for that. Uh, do you know if there's any future biosynthetic product that's similar to Tapisa that may be in development? I am not aware. Uh, at the moment, this is the, the, as I mentioned, the first and only FDA approved drug for this indication. I'm not aware of any clinical trial underway for a competing drug, not to my knowledge. Okay, great. So I believe that's all of the questions that we have for now. Um, Let's see. Oh, we'll, we'll have this as our uh, last question. So given it is an anti-inflammatory drug, does it, do you find that it improves dry eye symptoms as well? Yes. Um, it's hard to sort out whether it's due to the fact that it's anti-inflammatory or whether their uh, reduction in proptosis and uh, lag of um, are the cause, but yes, for sure. The dry eye gets better. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Um, cool. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for answering all of our, all of our questions. We have over 1100 people on, so uh -oh. had lots of people interested in, in your talk. It's well, nice not to have. So, so honored. Thank you.